Good morning, friends and brethren. So very good to see you this morning. We have a lot of folks gone. Holiday weekend, a lot of people traveling, I know. It was good to see some visitors with us as well. We're happy to, to have you with us. I want us to turn to the 100th Psalm again, where Todd read for us a few moments ago. And as a point of emphasis, we're going to read this again. What an incredible psalm. And I think helps to kind of set the stage for what we're doing today. It's good for us to remember why we praise God. It's good to know and to remember who he is. The psalm reads, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. God desires our praise, and he is worthy of it. He is worthy of our adoration. He is worthy because he made us, and we belong to him. By faith, we become the people of God. And what an incredible thought that is, that we are the people of God. Every reason to worship him in song. We should worship God as our creator, to praise his name. To give him thanks. Our God is good and his love is beyond the comprehension of mortal mind. It's hard to describe the love of God. It's hard to put it in words. It's only when we stop and we think and we contemplate all that he is and all that he has done that we can even begin to grasp all that God is and his love for us. Our God is good and his love is incredible. And with these things in mind, it would be hard to imagine that we wouldn't sing to him. With these things in mind, it should make within us a desire to to acknowledge him, to praise him, to sing to him and to sing about him. To be filled with him, to be filled filled with his spirit. And so, of course, we sing. What else would we do? It's like in the Ephesian letter in chapter 5, verse 19, and Colossians 3, verse 16. You think of these passages and how we are to be filled with the Spirit and let God's will and his word dwell in us. And then the apostle says to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Of course, what else would we do? If we are filled with God and his presence and his beings, of course we would sing. And it becomes just a very natural response. Imagine standing before the Lord. And I'm going to say and and to admit, I think it's kind of hard to do to actually imagine standing before the Lord to be in his very presence. It's almost an, an unimaginable thing. And yet others have been in his presence. Take your Bibles. Look at Exodus chapter three. You will remember the story. In Exodus chapter 3, here we have Moses as he approaches the burning bush. The bush that was just not quenched, that, that didn't go out, and he went to see and to investigate. And when Moses saw that it was not consumed, he was amazed by that. And standing there to have God speak to him. Verse 5, and do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Indeed. But can we imagine? Being in the presence of God as that. And we think about the posture of Moses as he knew he could not even look at God, realizing that he was in his presence. There was no shortage of respect here. 
Moses knew exactly where he was. And he knew to whom he was speaking. There was no shortage of wonder and awe. The children of Israel at Mount Sinai in chapter 19. We've looked at this passage so many times and I can't help but go back there again. Because described for us is this incredible scene. Instruction of God to Moses of what to tell the people. And the people saying to Moses, yes, yes, tell God we will do everything just as he says. They quickly learned and understood that they were in the presence of God. <clears throat> when they had prepared and they had done just as God said on the third day, there they stood at the foot of the mountain. And God at the top of the mountain, the fire and the smoke that billowed there. They literally stood before the Lord. In verse 14, we begin reading. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. And then he said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations. And on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. And everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently, and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. If that doesn't make you shiver, I'm wondering if there is life in your body. If that doesn't make us just quake. To think about and to imagine these long ago standing in the very presence of God in awe and in respect. There's another occasion that comes to my mind, this from Revelation chapters 4 and 5. The Apostle John is given an incredible view and vision of heaven and all that is there. And he is in the presence of God. This throne scene is, is hard to fully explain or define other than what Scripture gives us here. And it certainly gives us a picture and here were the angelic beings that were circling and flying around the throne scene. And God is on the throne. And in chapter 4, verse 8, they were singing day and night, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and who is to come. And as that scene continues to unfold, verse 11, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things. And by your will they exist and were created. And yet in the scene there was one holding the scroll, God. But who would be worthy to open the scroll? Well, what is inside and what does it say? Oh, but there was only one worthy. There's only one who is worthy. Verse 9 says, they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. And I looked and I heard the many, the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven, on earth and under the earth, such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. 
And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Now isn't that quite a scene to think about and to have in our minds? But you know, what we understand from all of these passages is that to be in the presence of God is to be struck with awe and wonder. Respect and honor and glory to be given to God. How could we not? It would be natural in in such a setting to, to ascribe to God the glory and the honor that he deserves. To stand in awe. And we try to imagine that we are there. That we are standing before God and and, and what would we do and what would we say? And I wonder if we will sing like those angelic beings that are depicted to us in Scripture. I know this much for sure. That we will be in awe. Let's sing together. You are beautiful beyond description. Before the Lord. Because we would be in all. And we would want to give him. The glory and honor. That he deserves. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. When we worship God. We stand before that holy mountain. No, we're we're not at Mount Sinai like the children of Israel of old. And and in fact, we're not even before a physical mountain. Oh, but there is a mountain. In that spiritual realm, in that spiritual sense, the holy mountain that represents God. We stand before that mountain. It is described as the place of God. It is described as the place of God's people. And we stand before him in a life of service to him as we worship him. And ultimately, our desire is to stand before him in heaven to see and to understand that heavenly scene, that throne scene that scripture depicts for us. When Christians worship God, we come before that holy mountain. And I wish and I hope that we can understand that when we are gathered as God's people like this, To understand that we are in God's presence. And that we are worshiping Him. And and we should be in awe of Him just like those of old were. When they were at the holy mountain. Or as, as John saw the heavenly scene in the angelic beings there. It's easy for us in our our busy, busy life to come even to an assembly like this of the saints and forget who we are. To forget our reason and our purpose for being here. That our focus is on God. That our focus is on serving Him. That our focus is on lifting Him up, His name, and praising Him. 
Our assembly together is important. And it's why, I hope, it is why we look forward to the Lord's day as we do. To remember the Lord and his sacrifice, yes. And to praise him, to praise God. Our assemblies together are so important. And our week misses something when we're not a part of that. And God notices the difference too. Because this is where he would want us to be. To be a part of his people. To be ready and anxious and and wanting to, to praise him. In the book of Hebrews chapter 12. The writer gives us this, this picture. You know, when, when Christians come together, as we said, we come before that holy mountain. We stand before God who is the judge of all. Verse 22 says, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Boy, there's a lot said in that text that helps us to grasp what it is for us as disciples today, for us as Christians today, to be before God, to stand before Him, to worship Him, to do so with reverence, and why we would worship Him with such reverence. I want us to know and to understand just how special our assemblies together are and how God views these things. And I want us to be excited about being together for this reason, for this purpose, and to worship God in this way. We assemble together before the mountain of God. Let's think about that as we sing. We shall assemble. serve him in full recognition of who he is and of his power and might. God reigns from heaven and is in control of all. It's hard for us to get a full scope of all that God is and how great and how vast his power. Scripture identifies for us many gods. There were many gods that men served throughout the generations. But there is one God who is the maker of all. One God who has 
power. In time, the power of men and the power of God are, are gods are proven to be nothing. Great shrines around the world are uncovered from time to time where gods once stood. And those gods are gone. And so are the buildings that they once stood in. God's kingdom and his rule are without boundaries. There is a universal reign or rule of God. We're going back to the Psalms. I want you to look with me. The 103rd Psalm. It's a wonderful Psalm in its entirety. One that that helps us to focus praise on God. And, And as the psalmist would say even in the first verse. Praise the Lord, O my soul, in my inmost being. Praise his holy name. And I hope that it is that way. That from us our praise comes to God even from our inmost being. But it's in verse 19 that it says, The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. And it gives us a glimpse of what we can't even fully understand, of just how expansive is the power in the kingdom of God, that he is and his kingdom is over all. That he is an awesome God is seen in the, in, the, in the power of his creation. In the 101st Psalm, beginning in verse 1. Praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He wraps himself in light as with a garment He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides the wings of the wind. He makes wind his messengers, flames of fire his servants. He set the earth on his foundations. It can never be moved. You cover it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. But at your rebuke, the waters fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took flight. They flowed over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place you assigned for them. You set a boundary they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. The psalm just goes on describing and defining for us The power, the majesty, the greatness of God. We think about some we read of in scripture, great leaders of old, those who wielded power. Pharaoh in Egypt. Who would question the power of Pharaoh in Egypt of old? But his power was nothing compared to Jehovah God. The earth moves at the command of God. He commands those things. And then there's the scene of the children of Israel at the Red Sea when they were fleeing Pharaoh. And the Lord is about to put to end the power of Pharaoh. And it is the Lord who, by his command, by his will, separates the sea. And the children of Israel cross on dry land. He demonstrates his power. And we read about that over and over and over throughout the holy text. And we're reminded of who God is and his power and his greatness Undoubtedly, there were those who feared the power of Pharaoh because he was a powerful leader indeed. But how was his power and compared to God? It was, it was nothing at all. But God, with just the flick of his hand, takes away the power of Pharaoh. The strength of men is nothing. But the power of God is great. The 111th Psalm, Psalm 111, verse 7, beginning. The works of his hand are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are steadfast forever and ever, done in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Indeed, to God belongs all eternal praise. God is powerful and he is as well holy. He is an awesome God. And he deserves our praise. He deserves. He deserves us bowing before him. Song number 14 in the supplements. Awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above and with some power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with some power and love. Our God is an awesome God. can it be how can it be that God would love us so much it's hard to understand it is for me it is hard to understand how God could love us all so much when you consider sometimes how we struggle so much with the issues and problems of life And when we make foolish decisions, sometimes when we know better. And how sometimes we just battle with temptations of sin, and it seems at times sin wins. That sin controls. How could God love us so much? Why would God remember us? It is truly an awesome God who has loved us beyond measure. A God who has demonstrated time and again his power, his might, his dominion, his rule, his kingdom. A God who has proven his capacity to help and bless those who would be his people. A God who has shown his grace and mercy time and again who has demonstrated his desire to have a people of his own, to have a people to whom his grace and mercy can overflow. How could God love us so much? Jehovah God has called his people to rise above, to rise above sin and to worship him. God has called his people to be different from the world. God has called his people to to look to him. To stand at the foot of his mountain. To worship him. To know him. To remember him. To listen to him. To obey him. To be counted as one of his own. Still, how, how could God, how could he love us so much? Because we know our own failings. We know our own weaknesses. We know our own sins. And God knows them too. And yet he still loves us. And yet he still calls us to follow him. 
And yet even when we try to move closer to him, we, we still struggle because of sin. You know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23 reminds us, God in his amazing grace, seeing our plight, offers us help to remove sin. And even while plagued with sin, he made for us a means to be free. Love that is truly amazing. Love that reaches beyond what we can even comprehend. Love that is his perfect love is what is offered to you and me. And that's what he's offering us, his love, love that that is, is more than we can grasp. Love that desires that we will reach out to him. And he offers us that hope that if we reach out for him, he is there. He has provided the means. He has given us the reason to reach for him. He has created the, the way for us to have a relationship with him through his son, Jesus, through his blood. Our Heavenly Father, willing to sacrifice His Son. It's amazing. Look at Romans chapter 5. Turn over to Romans chapter 5 for a moment. To think about this, to be reminded of this. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. For when we were still without strength... In due time, Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Here's what God has done. Here's what he has offered to us and for us. A means of a relationship. God's love is inconceivable to the mortal mind. More than we can understand. What we know, if we're honest with ourselves, here's what we know. We know that we don't deserve his love. And yet God's love is freely given. And his son, willing to be God's sacrifice, willing to die for us. As the Apostle John said, so simply, when Jesus was walking up, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus, in a description that, that helps us to know that Jesus knew his place, Jesus knew his purpose when he said, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus understood his purpose. Even before he came to this earth. Philippians chapter 2. The apostle helps us to see this. Gives us this insight. Speaking of Jesus that being in the form of God. Did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation. Taking the form of a bond servant. And coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. How can it be that God loves us so much? It's hard to understand. But we can't argue with the fact that God's love is that great. Because he has demonstrated for us what he is willing to do to save us. But still, it's with some amazement, I think, that we sing, you know, can it be? 
that we really think and we wonder, sometimes we question, how, how can it be that God loves us this much? Let's ask that question as we sing. But we can answer it too. The answer is given why he loves us so much.